time for everything. Uh, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, and I, I have a, a little bit of an introduction, so we'll have some time for it if there if there are latecomers um, to get them seated. Um, so good evening. My name is Carrie Jarrell. Uh, I'm a faculty member in the Department of English and Philosophy, and I'm really uh, thrilled to have you all here this evening um, and to welcome you to our first event in this year's Murray State Reading Series. Um, before we start, a few housekeeping items. First, um, silence your cell phones, please, if you haven't already. Um, Second, uh, as you probably saw, we have books for sale in the gallery afterward, and um, after the reading, Annette will move to the book table, so if you'd like to have your copy signed, um, she'd be happy to do that. Um, we also have some refreshments, um, so we hope that you'll stick around uh, and chat and purchase a book. Um, I also want to mention um, <coughs> the exhibit. Uh, in the galleries here, the, the main space. We're really grateful for the art department um, letting us use this space. Um, we've had readings in here before, but it's been a while and it's really nice to be back in the gallery. Um, if, you, if you don't know, this is kind of a, this is a great week for the fine arts. Um, we have our reading tonight, um, tomorrow evening at 5 o'clock, the juror for the Magic Silver Show, which is the, the main gallery show, will be giving a talk at 5 o'clock, and then there's a reception after that, and then um, on Thursday is the concert in Levitt Auditorium with Chris Thiele and the Louisville Symphony. Um, <clears throat> so it's a great week for the arts at Murray State. Um, and we're happy to be kicking that off and to, and to be collaborating um, with the art department in their space. Um, I have a few people I want to thank very quickly. Um, Melissa Brown and Betsy Puckett from the Department of English and Philosophy. Kayla Allen Dunn in the Office of Development. Don Klukin in the University Bookstore. The WKMS crew and Jeremy McKeel from Digital Media Services um, for all of their assistance with hosting and promoting this event. Most importantly, we would not be here this evening without the generosity of the children of Clinton and Mary Oakland Moore, um, who established this residency in honor of their parents. And I want to tell you a little bit about them um, and how their lives inspired this residency. Um, Gwen, would you mind turning that off maybe, maybe one of the lights? I don't know, we'll see if that helps a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Clinton Elstermore was born in 1916 in Pike County, Kentucky, where his family had lived since the early 1800s. Mary Opal Baldwin Moore was born in neighboring Letcher County in 1922. After their marriage in 1941, they ran a grocery business in Shelby Gap, Kentucky, in Pike County, very near the Virginia state line. Clinton served in Europe during World War II, and after his return, he and Mary Opal and many others in their region endured a particularly difficult time in the eastern Kentucky coal fields as a result of the post-war slump in demand for coal. One of Mary Opal's sisters had married and moved to Paducah with her husband. This sister became the link to western Kentucky. Clinton and Mary Opal made the difficult decision to leave the mountains and start over in Paducah. Clinton found a job selling cars and eventually owned Moore's used cars in Lone Oak. Mary Opal worked as a bookkeeper for Singer Sewing Machines and later as a secretary for Bankers Life Insurance until the early 1960s. Both Clinton and Mary Opal were wonderful storytellers. Clinton's stories were entertaining and humorous and Mary Opal kept their family stories alive by telling her children and grandchildren about their people in the mountains. Mary Opal also kept journals in spiral notebooks and wrote poetry, and a printing of one of her poems hangs in her hometown's museum in Jenkins in Letcher County. They raised enormous, plentiful gardens each summer and were generous with their harvests. They were always ready to serve a spread for anyone who happened to arrive at mealtime and had special concern for anyone who grew up having to go without. 
Their highest priority as parents was making sure their five children went to college. Among them, the siblings have 11 degrees, including four masters and three doctorates. Clinton and Mary Opal were also immensely proud of their grandchildren, who they often said were the finest, smartest children they'd ever seen. <laughs> The Clinton and Mary Opal Moore Appalachian Writers Residency was established for 2017 through 2022 with gifts from Shirley Moore Menendez, John C. Moore, Tom Moore, Nancy Moore Waldrop, and Jane Moore Waldrop in honor of their late parents and their family's Eastern Kentucky roots with the goal of strengthening literary connections between Appalachia and Western Kentucky while also enhancing the creative impression and professional growth of students pursuing creative writing here at Murray State. It commemorates the Moore's East to West journey in hopes of fostering understanding between the two distinct regions as well as creative, uh, as well as uh, collaborating um, in the two distinct regions, sorry, in Kentucky connected by the Cumberland River. Thanks to their continued generosity of the Moore siblings, we're pleased to announce this year that the uh, Clinton and Mary Opal Moore Appalachian Writer in Residence will continue through 2026. So at this time, I'd like for us to recognize and applaud those members of the Moore family who are here with us this evening. There's a crew of them, so would you all please stand up? Um, and for sharing that love through the gift of this residency. Thank you. The Clinton and Mary Opal Moore Appalachian Writers Residency enables us to bring to campus an author whose life and work is deeply connected to Appalachia. And we are thrilled for Annette Sunuk Clapsaddle to be joining us this evening. An enrolled citizen of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians Annette Clapsettle holds degrees from Yale University and the College of William and Mary. Her work has appeared in Yes Magazine, Lit Hub, Smoky Mountain, Living Magazine, South Writ Large, Our State Magazine, and The Atlantic. And as I was saying this to the group this afternoon, she was also on a recent episode of um, PBS Southern Storytellers, if you've been watching that series, um, which our own graduate um, S.G. Goodman has also been featured on, um, this week. So we have even more connections. Um, after serving as executive director of the Cherokee Preservation Foundation, she taught high school for over a dozen years. She is the former co-editor of the Journal of Cherokee Studies and serves on the board of directors for the Museum of the Cherokee Indian and is the president of the board of trustees for the North Carolina Writers Network. She established Bird Words LLC in 2022 and works as an independent contractor and consultant. This year, in partnership with Museum of the Cherokee Indian, she launched Confluence, an indigenous writers workshop series that seeks to bring indigenous writers to the Koala Boundary in Cherokee, North Carolina, to work with aspiring writers several times throughout the year. Her debut novel, Even As We Breathe, was a finalist for the Weatherford Award and named one of NPR's best books of 2020. In 2021, it received the Thomas Wolfe Memorial Literary Award. Silas House, the current Kentucky Poet Laureate and award-winning author, praised Even As We Breathe as a remarkable and important debut novel that announces a major new voice in Southern literature, and one that we have waited far too long to hear. Class that offers us characters we will never forget, a palpable sense of place, and an intricate plot. But most of all, she allows us to luxuriate in her rich language, which is evident from the first sentence to the last. Publishers Weekly also calls the book both an astonishing addition to World War II and Native American literature, and a novel that sings on every level. Please help me welcome Annette Clapsaddle.
here. All right. Okay, thank you so much um, for that introduction. I am really happy to be at uh, Murray State. I often joke with some friends in Kentucky um, that I am establishing residency in Kentucky in addition to my citizenship in North Carolina because I spend a lot of time in this state. But this is um, the farthest west I have ever been uh, in Kentucky, so I'm thrilled to be here. I want to especially thank the Clinton and Opal uh, Moore family, uh, the Department of English and Philosophy here, uh, as well as the Creative Writing Program, um, for your support of this opportunity. Uh, it's, it's thrilling to know that, that folks like Silas House and Crystal Wilkinson and Robert Geip um, have all been here uh, before. Those are definitely some heroes of mine. So I'm happy to, to follow where they lead, for sure. Um, <clears throat> I find opportunities like this um, a really important way to connect with people across the country. And so while I'll read some from my novel, um, I want to also kind of talk about the backstory of the novel and what goes on uh, in my crazy mind um, when it comes to thinking about what I'm writing and how I'm writing it um, and what audiences are going to receive it. Um, so um, Even As We Breathe was published in 2020, it was a great year for putting out a debut novel. Um, but uh, th there have been some, uh, some upsides to it um, in terms of being able to be in places virtually that I would never get to be in before, right? That opportunity came up. Um, and so um, it's also interesting to think that, that, no that this novel, Even As We Breathe, is the first published novel by an enrolled citizen of my tribe. Um, which is pretty ridiculous, 2020, right, is the first novel um, published by, a, fellow, by a, a tribal member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. Now, that is not to say that there are um, published novelists from the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma, um, but for a, a tribe who has the longest history of written language um, in the Americas, um, it's, it's pretty absurd. Uh, so a lot of my work is, is um, trying to amplify other uh, indigenous writers from my communities uh, to add to the conversation about our community and our culture because my uh, experience is not everyone's experience. Um, and so we have a lot more voices uh, that certainly need to be heard. Um, <clears throat> So there's a lot I want to talk about on this topic, and if I go too fast um, on any one point, if you have questions about it, I'm going to save some time at the end um, for questions, for sure. All right, so first, a trivia question. Jane, you may know the answer to this, so you're not allowed to answer. <laughs> I'm not sure if you do or not. Um, I want you to take a look at the image on the screen. And I'm, I want to ask you if anyone knows who this is. I'm getting, for the virtual audience, no one's raising their hands, right? Um, okay, so you may not know who, uh, specifically who this is. What do you know about this individual based on the image on the screen? Or what do you think you know, excuse me, about the image? What might you guess about this individual? Okay, so we got Native American. We've got even more specific over here, Chief. Status. Some status. What tells you that, sir? Pedro. Okay, so in the image, again, for, the, for uh, anybody who's just listening, um, there is an uh, individual with a headdress on, uh, which tends to indicate some kind of status or leadership. Anything else you might discern about this person? I mean, I've gotten all kinds of crazy things in the past, so don't be afraid. 
Because I'm setting you up completely, you know, right? <laughs> Okay, so possibly an actor, right, who's white, not native. Possibly. Yep. You can always tell that he's well fed. <laughs> 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 but, like, look. Yes, I mean, yes. Rock, this rock's doing great. I <laughs> love that answer. <laughs> yes. I'm going to start thinking about myself as well fed, also. <laughs> I love that. So, <laughs> so the uh, person on the screen happens to be my grandfather, Osley Bird Sanuk. And the way that he is presenting himself is 100% inauthentic. Um, Osley was a two-term chief, so you're actually right. He's a two-term chief for the Eastern Band of Cherokee. But he was also a world heavyweight wrestling champion, so you're also oh, right. <laughs> and he used that culture as his gimmick. He was known, he wrestled as the Cherokee Chief. And he wrestled all over the country. Um, I believe, I could be wrong, I may have my notes wrong on this, but I think he even wrestled for uh, the heavyweight championship in um, um, in Boston um, at, at the garden. So, um, and he was also an entrepreneur. He had a uh, business in Cherokee. Um, and I love, love to, to start presentations with this because you get all kinds of guesses, um, like the Hollywood actor um, guess, uh, because that's what he's doing, right? He is acting, it's a black and white photo, so it's difficult to tell. Um, there's certainly plenty of examples of white actors depicting Native Americans on screen. Um, I was trying to think of some of, I think someone at one point even said Al Capone, um, <laughs> which I also love because my grandfather was also a taxi driver in Chicago, and that's a whole other story. And he once drove Al Capone in a taxi. So it's funny how things are connected. Um, but I, I like to show this picture and talk about imagery um, because one of my jobs as a writer who's writing from a very specific culture and community is to think about characters as complex individuals. I cannot give you this image and not talk about the complexity of this image and what motivated him to dress in this way when he was wrestling, right? Um, and, um, and, and tell you the funny stories like one time he was, he used to be a wrestling promoter too after he stopped wrestling. Um, and he was speeding to a match in Asheville, which is about an hour away from Cherokee, um, where the Koala boundary is. And he got stopped by a highway patrolman. And this, this is a story told by a reporter who later wrote about it. Um, he was pulled over. And as the officer is walking to the car, Osley leans over to the glove compartment and pulls out a piece of paper. He gets out of the car, which you shouldn't do, but he gets out of the car and meets the officer. When he comes back, this is from the vantage point of the, the reporter, when he comes back to the car, he gets in, he takes the paper he had gotten from the glove box, he throws it back in the glove box and slams the... Um, glove box, and the reporter says, well, what'd he say, chief? And Osley said, he said he didn't want to be an honorary Indian, because <laughs> that's how he was going to get out of a speeding ticket. <laughs> so um, he certainly played with the imagery that people expect uh, his whole life, um, and it, that's just a really uh, authentic part of our culture. Um, it, was, it's, it was a huge part of our economy for decades, um, this understanding of what the consumer wanted from our culture and kind of safeguarding our authentic culture from that, but also capitalizing on, on the economic side of things. So these are certain uh, complexities that I like to think about in my work um, when I develop these characters. Um, and one of the reasons is because I, I do feel compelled to push back against stereotypes that have existed in Native literature, you know, since, since the first character kind of hit the page. 
Um, it, native literature prior to, I'm even going to say, you know, 20 years ago, and that's being generous. It's actually very recent that, that there are changes. But uh, native literature was largely written by non-native people. Um, it included very flat native characters, usually not main characters. The same is true for film. Um, and the stereotypes that come up in, again and again are um, these uh, concepts. I say magical realism here, but it really is verging more on magic, like straight up magic um, in that literature. Uh, this communing with nature. Uh, I think I told a group earlier today that I have three pets. I have two dogs and one cat, and every day I talk to them, but they have yet to talk back to me. <laughs> so I may be failing as a native person, or this is a stereotype. Um, but a lot of the imagery that was being consumed was in regards to Western tribes. Um, and if you think about headdresses and teepees and things like that, that is not Cherokee. That is, those are images from Western tribes. Um, but, but people saw them on the screen um, and then in literature as well. Uh, and so it, that imagery was made for entertainment purposes. But what really drives me is not just correcting that imagery just for the sake of authenticity. What really drives me is an understanding that law is literature and literature is law. And thus, literature affects our everyday life. It affects our legal standing um, within this country specifically. Uh, and I'm going to show you a couple of examples of that uh, in just a little bit. We won't have time to deep dive into to law and literature. Um, but I, I remember when I was in college, I took a class called Legal Fictions. And all we did was read pieces of literature that directly affected the way law of that time was written. Um, and... And you see that in things like slave codes and, and whatnot. Uh, it, it shows up in literature in uh, really stunning ways. So when I talk about correcting stereotypes, it, it's pretty practical for me. Um, it's, I want to make sure that our community is treated legally the way we should be authentically, right? Uh, it's not just about creating literature. Um, the biggest problem that is found in, in some of the earliest... Um, Native American literature is this kind of past tense existence that Native Americans are in are part of history, right? We can study them in history class, right? Um, and it's interesting because I have a lot of conversations with people saying, yeah, I didn't learn about Native people in history class. It's not in the, in the history books. It should be. And I totally agree but it should be elsewhere as well, not just the history books. Um, we are a living culture, of course. I mean, I think I am. Yes, yes, I'm living right now. So, um, and just, I, you know, I mentioned this um, a couple of minutes ago, um, but we have a long history of literature um, in the Cherokee culture. Uh, wampum belts uh, in that top image there uh, were used as legal, um, contracts um, as mnemonic devices, uh, storytelling methods, uh, and those beads, as, um, if you're familiar with wampum, uh, come from the coast. So we're all over, of course, the southeast and very extensive trade routes, um, so it's used as currency uh, as well. Uh, the other examples you see here, this is Sequoia's syllabary, so it's the written system of the Cherokee language. The first uh, indigenous written language in the Americas. This predates Indian removal. So does that newspaper. That's the Cherokee Phoenix. And that newspaper was printed by the Cherokee in both English and the syllabary. So um, we actually used um, that document to communicate during the removal period in a coded way um, that you had to know Cherokee to understand uh, some of the, the dialogue going on about the removal. Um, so again, very sophisticated, still pre-removal period. Of the 1830s, if, um, just to kind of um, root you in, in history there. <clears throat> so 
Um, I was choosing a protagonist that uh, the, the novel is set the summer of 1942. Um, the Grove Park Inn, which is an upper class resort in western North Carolina in Asheville, it's places where presidents vacation in the mountains. Um, it is fact that the summer of 1942, the Grove Park held access, uh, access diplomats and foreign nationals as prisoners of war. Uh, and so that's where, where the novel is set. And then County Sequoia um, is a young man from Cherokee who is joined by Essie Stamper, a young woman from Cherokee, and they go to work at the Grove Park that summer. County is eventually accused of being involved um, in the disappearance of a diplomat's daughter. There's some other mystery going on back home, and of course um, we have to work through his relationship with Essie as well. Um, but I chose a, a, a protagonist who's telling the story retrospectively uh, because as a 19-year-old, you might imagine, County's, um, uh, <laughs> his, his way of speaking would not be as refined as an older gentleman, right? And I didn't want to add to the previous uh, literature that depicts Native American characters as being uneducated. Uh, I didn't want to give the audience anything that made them think that another Cherokee character was not sophisticated. And so I used a craft element of telling a story retrospectively in order to push back uh, on a stereotype there. Uh, certainly you'll be in scene with 19 year old County and his language changes uh, a bit when he's in scene. Um, <clears throat> and even though, you know, this is a historical fiction novel, um, I always, you know, people think I'm just joking, but I did not realize I was writing historical fiction until my publisher asked me to fill out a marketing plan, and I had to check the historical fiction box, and I was like, oh yeah, this is 1942, that was a little while ago. Um, but I have always pushed back against, you know, um, rooting indigenous characters in the past, primarily because um, it seems like so many people ask me to write about the Trail of Tears. First of all, it has been done. Second of all, I'd rather not cement uh, Cherokee people in the most tragic point in our entire existence over and over again because our narrative is far more complex uh, than tragedy. And even though uh, County certainly uh, encounters difficulties during this time period, I wanted to look at um, these themes and motifs uh, in a way that, that moves the time clock forward. So there is a mention of the history of the Trail of Tears and then we fast forward to 1942 and we'll talk about imprisonment still. We'll talk about imprisonment of citizens um, as being interned um, as well in this uh, 1942 landscape. Um, so I thought I'd give you just a little taste of the book here. Um, <clears throat> place is very important uh, to me in everything I write. Um, I was just joking that um, I was asked to pitch a, a story to Travel and Leisure magazine, but I, there's, I can't even ask them to send me to Europe or anything because I can't write about places like that. Like I write about home all the time, and I am so affected by uh, a place that that comes out uh, in my writing. So this is from the prologue uh, of the book about the place. When I take you there or when you find it on your own, just know that what the old folks say is true. This land is ours because of what is buried in the ground, not what words appear on paper. But also know this, what is buried in the ground isn't always what you think. It's just the beginning. It's the beginning of the story, the beginning of all of us who call ourselves homo sapiens. Fitting, I guess, that what I found buried just as I was trying to figure out how to become a man and still be human was the very thing that threatened to take it all away. 
Just when I began to see what taking control of my own life might look like, I realized I was not who I thought, and neither was this place. That summer in 1942, when I met her, really met her, before I found myself in a white man's cage and entangled in the barbed wire that destroyed my father, I left the cage of my home in Cherokee, North Carolina. I left these mountains that both hold and suffocate and went to work at the pinnacle of luxury and privilege, Asheville's Grove Park Inn and Resort. I guess I convinced myself that I could become fortunate by proximity, escape Uncle Bud's tirades and my grandmother Lishi's empty kitchen cabinets just by driving a couple of hours up the road. It sounded good to tell folks I was raising money for college, but the truth was I didn't know what I was doing. I just didn't want to do it there anymore. And if I stayed any longer, I would become rooted so deeply, I might as well have been buried. Um, I think I'll skip a little bit. I squatted there by the fence line along the boundary of the Grove Park property and grasped the bone by its middle, pointing both ends upward, studying its curvature, a bent bobble for my adolescent, idle adolescent hands to fidget with in the absence of a ball stick or a soldier's rifle. I can't recall playing with many toys as a child. That's probably why the bone spoke poetry to me as a young man. It was smooth and porous, its slight C curve angled in motion, calling to be grasped, used, a weapon at least in some primitive function of strength. Like a subhuman scythe, though innately human, maybe even the very core of humanity. And now, as I recall the moment out loud, it was an embarrassing indulgence of make-believe for, for a 19-year-old. It's all right to laugh. I don't blame you. Such an extraordinary object to be inside flesh. It was wholly earthen, not sterile or cellular. It was natural in a way we pray our body is not. Momentary, seasonal destined for expiration. The bone had lost its story, petrified into a mere alkaline deposit, transient and nameless. Then I'm just gonna to skip to a little section that gives you a sense of landscape in Cherokee. Except for the valley that, excuse me, except for the valley land that began pimpling with impoverished storefronts, Cherokee was not the Cherokee of today. Cherokee was mud-chinked log cabins burrowed into mountain hollers, surprising expanses of neat garden rows jutting across rare, unwooded land at the end of roughly carved dirt roads, half washed away in the spring and summer and impassable with snow in the winter. No matter where human life chose to carve its mark on the land, it did not stray far from water, creek, river, stream, or fall, Follow one and you would find Cherokee. You would find the smoke from wood stoves. You would find red clay ground in to fine ginger dust coating the surface of life. And you could not find it directly from any highway. To trust a road is still a road when it looks like a creek, is not and has never been for the tourist heart. Yet it is only that trust that will get you from a road sign to home, or in my case, from Leashy's where I lived to Bud's where I worked. So this is a little bit later in Cherokee, but it looked very similar um, in 1942. And when I was doing research for the book, there, was, there were not a lot of written records, especially about Grove Park. As you can imagine, they weren't keeping a lot of records while they were keeping prisoners on the property. Um, and so I turned to photographs because that's what I wanted to capture anyway, was the feeling of being in that place at that time. I was not writing a World War II novel. I never want to write a World War II novel because I can't. I am not... Um, I, I'm not so interested in the details um, of combat um, as I am about the uh, people of a place. My husband is a historian. He reads a lot about wars, um, and I wasn't going to give him anything else to tell me I was wrong about. So <laughs> um, This is not necessarily a war story, though it um, certainly takes place in that context. And this is the Grove Park. Um, this, again, it's kind of approximate. Uh, in terms of time a little bit earlier. 
Um, but it, the Grove Park still looks a lot like this. How, has anybody here been to the Grove Park? Yeah. Uh, it's a great place to visit if you're in Western North Carolina. If you can afford to stay there, kudos to you. Um, a, lot, a lot of times people will ask me how much time I spent at the Grove Park while I was riding. It's like I can't afford to stay at the Grove Park. Uh, so, but I also didn't want to have the Grove Park of present day um, mess with the atmosphere I was conveying in 1942. But the main building still, uh, definitely the facade and even some of the interior um, looks the same. And if we have some time at the end, I'll tell you some weird coincidences about the book and the current day Grove Park. <clears throat> okay, let's see. So, um, I believe it is on page um, 34. There's, there's even um, a mention of, yep. Uh, there's a mention of how the Grove Park, that's a different page, not 34, but it's later in the book, um, how the Grove Park is in Asheville. And Asheville um, used to be called uh, by the Cherokee the place where they raced. Um, and so even Asheville is Cherokee land. Um, there's um, a confluence of two rivers there that the Cherokee historically raced canoes on. Um, and um, much of downtown Asheville. How many of you have been to Asheville? Okay, more of you, yeah. Um, much of downtown Asheville is on a Cherokee village site, actually. So I wanted to blur those lines of of who belongs where, of where boundary lines are um, for people. Because if we think in terms of the history of the world, much of the lines that tell us where, where to go and where to stop um, are kind of, um, well, they're imaginary lines, right, um, that we just abide by. They are legal fictions um, in a lot of ways. So this is a postcard from the Grove Park. Um, and you can get a sense obviously not during wartime. <clears throat> ah, getting used to another computer. There we go. Um, so when I think about my role as a writer, as I mentioned, uh, to correct some of these stereotypes, to present a culture that hasn't had a lot of airtime, so to speak, I think about this quote from uh, the scholar Craig Womack, um, and he, he writes about native literature in general. Um, and I know that you all can read. I'm just making an assumption since I'm at the university. Um, but I will also read it aloud um, because I, I, I really do live by this um, in the back of my head. I'm always thinking, I was dismayed at just how little formal discussion there was among Indian writers concerning who controls Indian literature, what is the purpose of Indian literature, what constitute native, constitutes native literatures of excellence, how such criteria should be determined, what set of ethical issues surround being a native writer, and what role should tribes play in the process. What happens, it seems to me, is that when we abandon such a discussion, we give away all power to a group of outsiders who then determine our aesthetics for us. And this happens without even a fight. Um, and so I mentioned earlier uh, this concept of legal fictions or how law and literature uh, have an exchange. I'm going to give you two examples. I'm going to go through them really quickly because um, this can get, um, well, it can get pretty nerdy for a Tuesday evening, um, but I'm happy to talk more about it. Um, there are two examples that I think really, um, really highlight how early American literature influenced um, federal Indian law uh, and federal Indian removal. Um, the two that come to mind for me are the legacy of um, captivity narratives and um, uh, the early um, colonial narratives and romantic period um, with writers such as Nathaniel Hawthorne. So, um, one prime example is from the Scarlet Letter. Um, how many of you have read the Scarlet Letter? Congratulations to those who have not read the Scarlet Letter. No, I actually really, I remember enjoying reading the Scarlet Letter. 
Um, but, it, but when I went to teach it to high school students, I was like, why? Why did I do this? Like, um, it, it's, it's pretty thick, right? Um, so, but Hawthorne, um, as a, you know, a great American novelist, um, was, was actually cementing the first concepts of Native Americans uh, in literature. Um, his characters, you may not even remember them because um, they were flat, they were not really attached to the larger pro plot so much, a little bit in terms of sin and, and themes in the book. Um, they are always placed in the wilderness, in the wild. They're referred to by two colors, uh, red and more often black, the black men in the, in the forest. Um, and these, as, you know, as those who study um, literature know, um, are symbols, right? Red and black, especially in the scarlet letter, um, symbolize fear and sin um, that should be avoided you start seeing the occurrence of the stereotypes about herbal medicine and magic that, that these people of the woods have. <clears throat> and then one of the, I think one of the most entertaining types of early literature to talk about, um, which may sound odd, um, are captivity narratives. How many of you are familiar with captivity narratives? Mary Rowlandson, for example... I know I've got some uh, students of, of literature in here. Um, so just for those who aren't, um, captivity narratives were written typically um, by or from the viewpoint of Puritan women in the colonies. Um, they are stories of white women being captured by native men. Children are killed. Um, women are uh, abused and scandalized. Um, and it, these were really popular. In fact, Mary Rowlandson's um, captivity narrative was the first bestseller in America. Why? Why are you asking? <laughs> um, because Puritans were not supposed to be writing fiction, right? Um, it, they could chronicle in diaries and whatnot. It needed to be basically memoir nonfiction. Um, but what some women, and I'm just going to say some women, like Mary Rowlandson did, was provide the first stories that were really racy, uh, highly sexualized stories, um, the, and really um, graphic violence um, in these depictions. Of course, uh, every you know the the villain being uh, the Native American captor. You start hearing some complex um, stories around women who end up living with um, their their captors. All of this. You, I am not standing here saying that violence didn't happen, kidnapping didn't happen, murder didn't happen um, at the hands of Native people. What I am standing here saying is it also happened the other way around. And you have um, these settlers who are moving into someone else's home, right? So to see the whole story. Um, but it's fascinating how it appears in literature. Of course, you, just, you get one perspective. Um, and it's, it's a really exciting read. I went back a few years ago because I was going to talk to some high school students about captivity narratives. And I thought, man, I don't know if they're mature enough to handle this Puritan literature, right? Um, but um, some other uh, examples for you um, from, the, from these two texts um, primarily. Um, really uh, put us back into this like deep woods mindset of this is where natives are and belong and they are wild because they are in the wilderness. Um, you start seeing literature that's communicated through um, visual art, um, images like this. We could probably, if we've got some art 
history majors in here walk through the elements of this composition, right? This woman uh, in this bright white uh, sign of purity, right, in, in just the way that she dresses. Uh, and the native men are still in the shadows here, right? This is a pretty popular image, and images like it are pretty popular. It comes out of the literature, uh, such as the captivity narratives. Um, I'm going to go through this really quick. I'm not trying to hide anything from you. Every time I go through it quick, I'm like, they, they probably think I'm trying to hide <laughs> my evidence. Um, but uh, these are just some excerpts from Hawthorne and from Rowlandson um, that, that work to kind of highlight some of the things I'm talking about. This uh, indigenous association with darkness and fear and untamed wilderness um, and, and magic in general. And then the reference to you know, Native Americans as, merciless, as having merciless intentions, um, very inhuman, um, and th this acceptance of violence and death. The, you know, a lot of the captivity narratives talk about the death of children uh, even. So this is what the country is founded on in terms of literature. Um, so it's not all that surprising that this kind of framework um, supported uh, federal Indian removal that came later down the road. Um, and so what's terrifying um, is to know that literature can do this. It's also very empowering to know that literature can do this. Um, so um, this is uh, Daniel Heath Justice. This is his quote at the top um, that that talks about, uh, that early literature is talking about these like transient native people. So it seems like it's not a big deal uh, to move this group of people off their, their homeland, right? This is what they're used to. They're just hanging out in the woods anyway, right? Um, huge deal. Like, you know, um, all of our values are tied to place. Um, so it's an, an, an uprooting um, of that. Um, the abduction and murder of women and children. Uh, in some ways, you know, that was some of the earliest um, rebukes to federal Indian policy was like, you cannot, you know, take these women and children and send them on um, this long march west. But when you, when you see that side by side of depictions of Native Americans supposedly not caring about the lives of women and children, it becomes less of an issue um, for the general public. We're not human in the way that white people are human in caring about women and children. Um, and then you, you even later see folks like um, Mark Twain um, and his, um, his analysis of civilization, right? It's spelled differently um, for effect in The Adve uh, Adventures of Huck Finn. But I was talking to the group at, at dinner about, um, about how advanced um, our culture has been. And so those were kind of bogus ideas rooted um, in early literature. Um, okay. So because I know that's important, um, I also, as a high school teacher where a large percentage of our student population was Cherokee, um, I also was aware that my students had no stories in, um, in commercial publishing. I assigned all kinds of literature from all over the world in my classes, but I never could hand them a book from an Eastern band writer. Um, and that, that was hard. That was hard for somebody who wants their students to connect to literature in general. Uh, and so the, probably one of the, the biggest compliments I've ever received um, on my writing came um, from a former student. And this is, NPR uh, did a story and included this, but um, I often use the writing process in my classroom to talk to students about success, but more so failure uh, as a writer. And so I, my seniors especially were always aware that I was querying agents and, um, you know, and publishers and whatnot. And I would get an email 
um, from an agent, for example. I would not read it until I was standing in front of my AP Lit class. And I'd say, let's see what they said, right? And so much of it was, thank you, but no thank you. Um, but I wanted them to see that. I wanted them to see the reality of it. So I had a special class that was with me when I got the news that the book would be published. So they were very invested in the process. They were a little less invested when I showed them the, the markups on the edits, right? They were like, whoa, you have to do that? And I'm like, yes, so stop complaining when I give you edits to do on your papers. Um, but um, so they were, the, they were the COVID class that started their freshman year during COVID. You know, they were, our, our time together went virtual at the end of their senior year. Um, but what was really neat about this class is they got to college and they started seeing the book on their campus uh, and sometimes in their classroom. And I had a student who's Eastern Band Cherokee. He was at UNC, he had just left to go to UNC Chapel Hill. He sent his mother a text and his mother screenshot the text and sent it to me. And the conversation went something like this. Um, I he, Colby, his name, is talking to his mother. He says, I just finished Annette's book. And his mother said, well, what did you think? And he said something to the effect of, Mama, which got me, Mama, I've never seen myself in a book before. People just don't write about people like us. And this is a kid at UNC Chapel Hill who I know had access to all kinds of literature, because he was in my AP Lit class. I know what we read. He loves to read. And he had never seen himself in a book or anyone like him. Um, he then went on to be a speaker when the next year UNC Chapel Hill dedicated a building in honor of the first Eastern Band student to graduate um, from the school. So for me, that is the full circle I'm looking for. Um, for students and young people and people from my community to see themselves in the work, um, but then to use that confidence to continue to change um, the larger perception uh, of Native people. So um, because of time, I'm going to skip through a few slides here, which is, some of this is going to look really weird. I can explain it in the question answer. That looks weird. There's a point to it. Um, <laughs> But primarily what I wanted to say is that um, literature, I mean, I, I think most people agree that literature is a way to build empathy. Um, and so I tried to make sure that my writing um, physically affects um, readers. And I do that through craft. Um, some, some people know that I'm an avid cyclist and mountain biker, spend a lot of time in the woods. And I want to convey that in my writing because I think that's how we feel empathy when we read and we physically feel it. So I often talk a lot about that. The other thing are the core values. I want to remain true to the seven core Cherokee values in my literature. Um, but that's a dialogue. That's not like, oh, yep, check, 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 right? It is a constant um, review and consideration of what makes us Cherokee. So my favorite of our seven core values is uh, possessing a sense of humor, um, which is why I have trouble writing for magazines like Travel and Leisure, because I think it's hilarious that Travel and Leisure even wants me to write for them, because I can't afford to go on any of the trips they ever talk about. So, um, <laughs> But um, I thought I would, I've got a couple of minutes, uh, if you don't mind. I'd like to read this section because this is uh, just an example of what I mean by uh, possessing a sense of humor. This is um, County really talking about Essie, um, the woman who is at the Grove Park with him. And he has developed a bit of a crush on her. So um, this is chapter 14. There were snapshots of that summer, literal and otherwise, that refused to fade, not because they are fantastic or even significant, but because they are elemental to what is now my experience. Maybe what is Essie's too. Essie was likely the most proper girl I'd ever met and most certainly the most sophisticated girl from Cherokee. She fit into 447, which is the room uh, that they kind of established their own culture in. 
that uh, nobody else knows about. She fit into 447 like one of the first edition novels we found there. And because she fit, I fit by association. Adopted into some modern clan by the clan mother herself. Mind you, that was where the maternal instincts began and ended. Essie corrected no more than my grammar on occasion. Quite the opposite, really. She led me to dangle on the edge of complete and utter failure and spin wildly in the awkwardness of it, dancing in delight at my blush. Go ahead, cow pie, I'll spot you, she encountered. And before I remembered who I was, I found myself upside down, attempting to walk across the length of the room on my hands. I crashed gleefully into the couch, unable to spare my breath from laughter's thievery. Essie, too, was unable to remain on her feet, overcome with amusement. She sank into the oversized leather chair and vibrated in a nearly silent, wheezing laughter until the clearest expression of the word squirrel eked out from her. I sat up straight, imagining that a varmint had joined our evening reverie. She, too, sat erect. But she was blushing, eyes wide and hand over her mouth. Squirrel, I repeated, where? Essie didn't answer. Her eyes fell. It was clear that I had not actually heard what I thought I had. Did you just, she didn't move. Essie Stamper, did you just pass wind? Cowpie, shut your mouth. You did. Hush, you did. County Sequoia, one does not speak like that to a lady. Well, most ladies don't speak through their backsides. <laughs> she fell into herself, hauling loudly. I know, right? I couldn't help it. You got me so tickled. It sounded just like you said squirrel, or more like you said squirrel. <laughs> I couldn't finish. I convulsed in the joy of her humanity. Stop it, cow pie. You keep this up and I'll call up a whole mess of squirrels and out and out scurry. Scurry of squirrels. Essie was always teaching me new words, most of which she likely found on the shelves of 447. My favorite word, though, of all the fancy, sophisticated, highfalutin words was cow pie. I know it sounds strange that I would want an attractive girl like Essie calling me a pile of cow manure, but even cow pies attract beautiful butterflies, delicate and indifferent to the stench of refuse. Thank you. And I'm happy to take uh, a couple of questions. I know we're a little short on time, but if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. <laughs> let, let me grab hers and then I'll grab yours. Um, what age do you recommend for, like, like, to start reading this book? Sure. So this, I mean, some people have talked to me about it, it being appropriate for young adult. Um, it is, you know, it's a coming of age story in a lot of ways. Um, I, um, I think middle school through adults can read this book. It's not written for YA. Um, but I know it's taught at, in high schools for sure. And funny story, my oldest son, who's 14, promised me this summer he was going to read this book. He didn't read the book. He still has not read it. Um, but I think he, I think he could. Um, and I think it's appropriate. Yeah. And then, yes. I'm just asking about the, uh, what's that work with it being a male uh, narrator? Yeah, thank you for that. So, um, you know, the simplest answer to that is that was the first voice that came to mind, but I do have to, like, question myself, right? Can I write from the perspective of a 19-year-old young man not being a 19-year-old young man? Um, and I think a few things were going on in my head. One, I obviously had taught a lot of teenage boys, men, young men. Um, I have an older brother. I have a ton of male cousins that I grew up with, and a lot of my friends uh, growing up um, were, were men. And what I kept seeing over and over with young men, especially in like high school years, um, was that about the time they got to high school, if they were Cherokee and they didn't have a super strong support system at home, 
they started falling through the cracks um, in the larger, predominantly white high school that we went to. Um, and I, and I'm talking about guys who were way smarter than me. Um, they had so much potential, but didn't have the support system. And I don't know what I, you know, how do I address that? Right? I can become a teacher, you know, for one, um, but also tell their story uh, in a way that makes them more human, I hope, for people, for educators that encounter them in the future. Uh, just to give you an example of, of the discrepancy that they faced, um, when I was in high school, um, I had a, a boyfriend who was on the football team. He was a white guy. Um, and we won't say his name because we don't talk about ex-boyfriends from high school. Uh, but anyway, we were walking down the hall and we passed um, a friend of mine I had gone to school with who's from Cherokee. Like my whole life we'd gone to school. He went to the same high school. And he was on the football team with my boyfriend. And I kind of spoke to him, you know, as we're passing. And my boyfriend, who wasn't very bright, just looked over at me and went, lazy Indian. And I was like, what? Uh, in that moment, he forgot who he was talking to, number one. Um, and number two, uh, I got a real peek inside of how people really think. Um, obviously, that relationship ended. Um, but that was the kind of things that they were up against. This was his teammate, you know, that he probably joked around with and, and all that. But that's what he really thought about him. Um, so when the book came out, um, one of those guys that I had gone to school with, who, who was brilliant, um, not long after the book came out, uh, they found him dead in the woods. And unfortunately, uh, that's a story of a lot of guys I went to school with. Um, and so I, I wanted to get their story out there, and, but I wanted to make sure it was a voice that was, you know, um, in line with, with the people I knew growing up and my students and, and definitely uh, got feedback um, about that. I also have two sons of my own, so like that male voice um, is in my head a lot. I have a soft spot for it. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's why I'm with, well, one of the reasons why I'm with University Press of Kentucky, I think, is because they, un they understand uh, this othering, this, the misconceptions about diversity in Appalachia, for example. Um, and uh, so my editor for this book was Silas House, which is it's a whole other dream come true kind of story. But um, I knew he was going to be the perfect editor because long before this novel was finished, when I was at Heinemann at the Appalachian Writers Workshop, we had a conversation about um, the misconceptions he deals with as a gay man in Appalachia and the misconceptions that I deal with um, as a Native American in Appalachia. And there's so much crossover there because of this narrative that, that Appalachia is not diverse, right? Um, and so I think we, are, we as Appalachians are still trying to explain who we are to the rest of the world um, when there are so many false narratives out there. Um, and it's, it's kind of like native literature is going through a similar renaissance to Appalachian literature where we, we finally have the microphone. Um, in some cases, we had to yank it back from, from some folks. But um, there's a lot of crossover um, there. And I feel super supported in the Appalachian writer community, um, just like I do in the, in the native lit community. Anything else? All right, well, I'm happy to talk to you as uh, we sign books out here, and thank you so much for coming out tonight.
our next reading is October the 26th. Um, it'll be in the Waterfield Library Gallery. Amy Wright, um, the poet and nonfiction writer, will be coming uh, to read for us. So we hope we'll see you there. Thanks. Have a good evening. <clears throat>